through their lives have contributed to even us today. And uh, that just always takes my breath. Uh, the other thing is just the uniqueness of us being human beings uh, and honestly breathe from the nostrils of God. Uh, and, you know, there's a value of every soul, no matter who they are, what they are, no matter anything about them. Uh, you know, that, that is so unique, the value, the fact that God breathed them into existence. That is amazing to me. And you know, all, you kind of catch the idea. There's nothing that should ever divide us from one another. Did you know that? I mean, really. Uh, you know, you think of all the things that divide us, standards, right? Racism. Sexisms, everything else, but you know, when God went, it was all the same. Exactly the same. That didn't mean, didn't uh, Anyway, oh, I, what I was intended to do tonight, I was really wanted to sing, get, talk about as a whole and in the, in the whole class was be able to engage us in talking to people. Uh, in particular, we looked at last week from uh, the woman at the well, you're all familiar again with that, right? Uh, who, was anyone not here last week? Was everybody here last week? Robert, you wasn't here? You're, you're fine. I swore you was here. Uh, uh, you wasn't here. We got, right, so. Anyway, we, we spent the entire hours, it often happens, because uh, I engaged, wanted to, to expose ourselves to, to Jesus in particular. Uh, and and when I do so, we've got Jesus of the flesh, and we have Jesus Jesus of deity. He is God. That's what it is. God in flesh. Uh, it, and Matthew says his name is Emmanuel, and that means God, one of us. It's really what it means. Or you can say it with us, because he was definitely with us in the flesh. Uh, the reason that's so significant for our salvation and, and why you must hold it in your doctrine, if I can call it that, is because without him being the purity of the flesh, he could have not been our sacrifice for our sins. So the necessity becomes him being God in the flesh, that he already had the power to subdue the flesh and overcome it, though it was a battle 24-7, and a most intense struggle his whole life, I do believe. Uh, when you refer to the sufferings of Christ, I think that was one of the hardest things is the contention of the flesh and spirit. We have that to a little bit of a degree, right? Right? Usually, though, how does ours, <laughs> how does, how does ours go, anyway? Uh, the contention between the flesh and the spirit. Which one do we usually yield to? <laughs> the flesh, Robert, what a good man. What, what did the rest of you say? Just one Robert to be the only center here. <laughs> okay. Uh, in all honesty, that's no, we, we fold to the flesh. Here's the heartbeat. Uh, sometimes we really struggle with it. Uh, we're miserable, and then we fall into it. And then we go through a uh, process that usually takes place. The Holy Spirit having to make this to our situation, back in this, uh, so forth. And then eventually we get around and maybe a confession, whatever else. They were experiencing forgiveness and then finally a realization, hey, he still loves me. And the neat thing, I think we're discovering even more so now, is that even in our failures, he yet loves us. And, uh, and at our worst, his mercy is greater. And, uh, and really, at our worst, he demonstrates his mercy and grace for the rest of the world to see. Isn't that something? And, uh, and he's really building you as his own trophy of his mercy. You know, hold his mercy as if you're a vessel, you know, like a glass vessel. And what people can, by looking at you in glory, will see is the mercy of God all filled up in you. So, you know. And notice, there's nothing for you to brag about, is there? <laughs> I, I think that's pretty funny, right? <laughs> I don't know why I find that funny. Everybody wants to think there's a reason, you know, that God's doing something, you know, to me. And there is a reason, it's God. God's reason. 
And, uh, and when he does demonstrate his grace and mercy. Do you remember uh, the word demonstrate? Uh, this was brought up to me yesterday. Does anyone know the theme that brought us because of a passage of scripture that spoke of a demonstration? That God demonstrated his great love toward us. Jason does, he's the one that reminded me. Did, what was it, Rosemary? Well, what? Oh, no, that's it. That was the theme. Demonstrate, yes. And, and guess the reason that I really want us to use things like that is so we can remember it. Now, you run across that word demonstrate and you can't tell me you just walk past it. But when you really understand, man, it's a praise. It's a, to pray about. And as he says, he demonstrated his great love and mercy. So he prayed it right in front of us and about us. And then the idea is that you get to join the praise. So you get into praying here in his mercy, his grace, and you live this life on, woo, you know, a parade is fun, you know, a parade is fun, it's a, exciting, it's beautiful, uh, and, you know, and we're parading where? We have a destiny, every parade has a destiny, yeah, and ours is in heaven, uh, you know, and so we're, we're just praying along and demonstrating to the rest of the world God's great love and grace and the work of his son. Pretty good, isn't it? Okay, if I can, uh, kind of coming back to the last week, there's a couple of points I'd like to readdress even with a small group, but one of them in particular is the, the, the idea of a woman at the well. You remember the saddie? Could anybody just tell me what was the motivation of using this illustration? What would we highlight? What was the theme of last week? I mean, who was the major, I, I put it that way, put it in theatrics, I guess, who was the leading character last week? And what was he characterizing? Who was the main character? Okay, thank you, Robert. Jesus was the main character. When I told you that, when I said he, because you see, there was only real two plain characters though, in the lead role, which was Jesus and a woman at the well. So if I hadn't said he, you you know, I said, I already told you half of it, but anyway, uh, yes, it was Jesus. And what's the significance? What was the significance of Jesus? Uh, and guys, by the way, I, can I say this, you know, uh, I don't know if this is a good term yet. It is a wonderful term. Soul winner. Carlos, I want you to be a soul winner. I want you to win souls. I want you to win them to... That means they're going to come from somewhere, and you're going to win them to Jesus. Or if I put it this way, I want you to win them to another place they're going to live. Okay? Do you understand how real these words that I'm saying is? As Jesus said, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, we know him to be Jesus the Christ, the promised Messiah, right, to take away our sins. Okay, but God has promised to give us this Jesus, right? And so God, so love the world, he gives us this Jesus, but as he gives him, there's something that has to be done. That whosoever, okay, and so when we think of the word believe in context with John 3, 16, and I'm not making this up, it's, it's the Bible. But in John 3, 16, do you realize what it just told you that's got to take place? No, listen to the word, believe. Whosoever, isn't that great news? Because that means that can be anybody. It can be anybody, it can be everybody. Yeah. Okay, whosoever can be me. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Uh, so anyway, guys, if you catch this, what does Jesus mean by John 3.16? I mean, you've heard John 3.16, right? Everybody, all your life. Uh, most of us have we heard John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever will just be lived in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So now Jesus said that he, or God said that he loves us. And out of that unconditional, unmerited, undeserved love, he gave us this gift. A gift who happens to be a person, his own 
beloved, the most valued, the most of importance to God, his only son. Right? Now he's given the gift, but then he says that whosoever be lives in him will not perish but have everlasting life. But my goodness, did you catch it? Tell me, tell me what all he's asking of you. Okay, but uh, if it helps start with him, what all did God do? One he loved. And that love gave the best and all that he had. Did everyone see that? And he gave it in this condition that whoever will live in him, that this one will do whatever it takes. But if you'll live life in him, you will not perish. But in fact, will have everlasting intimacy with God forever. And God with you. Everybody get this? Okay, now, think though, what does it mean to be live in? What's asked of us? Because there's something, I mean, it's big what he's asked of us. Now, don't get me wrong, look how big he's gone. You talk about big, he gave everything of eternity and eternity that's of value to it. Gave all that he had, the best he had. And this one, Jesus, the Christ, will be save us from our sins. And the only thing that's required of us is to be living in him. So how? What what's been required of us? I like to keep putting it that way. It's all right, Harvard Jim File. Okay. Why? You guys, what, what's required? This is big. We're going to go talk to people. We need to understand there's something really required of them. And if they don't ever follow through with this, they're, they're going to perish because the only way not to perish is to be living in Him. So, what, what else required? Can you tell me something? What's being asked of? Okay, Angel, we'll take you first and then Jay. Well, for what I've got to start off with your faith. If you don't have your faith in Him, you're not believing in Him, so you can't live in Him, if you don't have that faith in Him, and know sacrifice. Okay, okay, son. you're absolutely right. And I'd like to take you further step back. She's what she what uh, the part I heard her saying that rings so true is that you're being asked to to believe in him, which means he'd have to be real to you. You have to have faith. That means he's unseen, you haven't seen him physically, but he would have to be made so real to you, and that's only done through the what? The words of God, isn't it? Through hearing. So, see, this person that we've come to believe, he's got to have words of God that he can believe in. Do you see? Then those words is going to get past his words. They're going to become his reality. Is that it's going to become real to him? Man, if I live there, I'm prepared. And then what, what is really being required now? So now we know he won't, if he lives there, he won't perish. He's being asked to be lived. But into being asked to be lived, you're asking a person to do something else. Okay, let's put it in real simple forms. Let's say that we're all here in Phoenix. Or, yeah, okay. Uh, Phoenix, let me see. Uh, okay, we'll say it this way Arizona. And then we hear this everyone that lives in Mexico shall be saved. And reverse it to make you feel better. What's that? We'll go to Mexico and be safe, right? Okay. All right. But what you said, we'll just go to Mexico. And I think when we say that, this is what happens to us in our faith. See, a lot of times we think it's like a trip to Mexico or it's a spiritual retreat to Mexico. We go down, we discover Jesus a little while, da da da. We come on, go back right to the old ruts we were always in. Okay, in all honesty, <coughs> excuse me, oh, in all honesty, guys, when you believe in Jesus, you're asked, first of all, to move. You've got to sell out. You've got to move from everything that's here and lose its value and see that the only thing that's valued is the eternal life that's crossing that case of the border. Look at it that way. Does, it, does it, that make sense? <coughs> 
control, so you'd be moving out of here to live there. Yeah? And that means I brought in those old terms. There are old terms that but we let those things fall away a lot, and it's my own fault for doing it. But guys, here and there, uh, think about it. If you live here in Phoenix, we're using this as the lost world, or live here in Arizona as the lost world. And if you went across the border, that would be Jesus. And there's where you'd be living in you know. But you move into it. You live, you abide there. You abide in everything he is and what he has. <coughs> Make sense? And so he, that means you move out of here into his perfection. What do you have on this side? What do you have here? I keep that term. <coughs> You have to be able to bridge that. No, no, there's no bridge anything. Man, we don't want to be connected. We want to move back. Yeah. Uh, you know, and honestly, it really is. Uh, to sell it, like he sold all that he had that he might purchase that thief. And you see, uh, the scriptures just go on and on with different examples that, that he, you know, he left all that he had. Uh, Pilgrim's mm -hmm. Progress. He left his wife. He left his children. He left all of his friends, his old friends. He left everything that he might pursue and find relief from the burden that was on his back. Through the, through the crystal city. Uh, so, you know, guys, what, what we're talking about is we're moving out, right? Moving someplace, living someplace else. That's what we call conversion. That is to be converted. But to be converted first, you know, why would you move? Why would you move? Hmm? Okay, an adventurous spirit. There you start so committed. Yeah. yeah, boredom is a killer. You know, I, uh, I really believe it's the number one. The limit's got me in more trouble than anything. Uh, no matter how much you like something, sooner or later it gets boring, and so you need a new adventure. Yeah, you know. Okay. Move away from moving away from the old, you know, get rid of you know, in this case we're our sins behind us. There you go. Basically being born again you know. If you if you'll think of it like like trail really walk in, but here and there. See, here, all you have is a reality of sin. There, you have a reality of the one that took away our sins. Does that make sense? You know, uh, uh, here you have guilt and condemnation, just so, because it's all sin, right? But there, there is no condemnation. And you see, because Christ has already died for us. He was condemned for us. Does that make sense? Here you live separated from God, always running, hiding, respecting God and life. But there you live in intimacy with God. <coughs> Make sense to everybody? Let's have to turn around. So let's let's kind of try to come back to this. I want to spend about a few more minutes, guys, and we're going to pray it along. Uh, and by the end, I'm convinced nobody else is coming too. But uh, <laughs> uh, then they'll probably show up. <laughs> Somebody ought to call Katie and say, hey, we're having church down here. <laughs> I'll see you back on the phone. About a hundred people come showing up. Yeah. Uh, guys, we're talking about unique people. We can get any one of them. I think you all are. It is. It's just really. Okay, let's, let's uh, kind of think about this. So, word one is see people converted, right? Uh, consider the woman at the well for a minute. Tell me about her conversion. Tell her. Tell me about her moving across the border. I'll put it that way. Either way. But she just leaves. She had heard. She had heard of the Savior. Okay. Right. Okay, Terrell, you know, you, and, and boy, it's all right there in the text. The, the things that amazed me is Jesus has, here's, here's kind of the premise that I'm working from. Jesus is the greatest soul winner there is. He's the greatest in, te uh, in technique, you know, of soul winning. Uh, he has, you know, not only spiritual wisdom, but just so much 
God speaks practical wisdom. Uh, he avoids many of the one things that would stop us that we wouldn't even see. Okay? And so what I'm getting at is that Jesus' example as a soul winner is probably the best, best, highest level that we can get to for a training exercise, right? And by the way, how sincere do you think God is about us being soul winners? And if that's not a good term, I'd let you change it for yourself, but it's really all it comes down to is winning souls. See, souls that's already been won the satanic death and destruction. They're already there. Okay, Jason. How serious is he? You know, he uh, reconciled us, you know, and he, he gave that ministry over to us. And if you can understand reconciliation, there's a... Again, if I'm the CEO of a, of a company and I have somebody that I'm going to have in step in my place, my hands are off for that time. And you know, so in that, in that, when the reconciliation, he's, he's given that over to us. And, and he, he's not leaving us out there on the phone, but it's it's our job. Mm. That makes sense. That's us to get the job yeah. done. Yeah, it sure is. And that job, the reconciliation, literally, the word itself means to bring two warring parties together. And what you know or not, God's been at war with his man. Yeah. And it's lost us. God kicked already a sin, all the off, the nastiness, the ugliness, the harm, the hurt. God's been at war. And, uh, and it's justice demands payment and all those things. Yet God also provided Jesus as the sacrifice that his anger and so forth can be placed on Jesus instead of us. All propitiation. Well, once that's done, and he did that, then guess what? The parties, and we are at war with God. We are in enmity with God. We don't like God. We don't like God's standards. Everything he says to do, we don't. You know? And then again, just in thoughts, you know, like we, we don't even realize it. But our thoughts are not his. Our ways is not his. So we're missing all over the place. So you take these two parties, and then we feel guilty. We're running from him. And we avoid him at every chance that we can possibly can. And then every once in a while, when we run across somebody else that probably has his spirit, and because we don't see the presence of God, we attack him. You know, physically, in any way we can. And it's a warfare when we go to attack verbally, emotionally, whatever else. Say things, try to destroy a character, uh, whatever else. But it's a war, and really the war is usually with God. That's who it's really with. Well, we, the church, we, those that are saved, those that have moved, and now lives in Jesus, we only have one job to do here on earth while we're here. Jason's pointing out, and that's to get these two warring parties together. If you notice, was there a war at the well? Okay, the woman at the well. Was there a war at the well? Hmm. Well, I think there was even for Jesus, Christine. I mean, you know, he, it was a war, and he, he had to, you know, if it was me, I was probably scared of hell, you know, <laughs> you know, right on, you know but, but instead, you know, his battle was to never to give in to her unbelief, but to push past every phrase that we could bring her and see he's getting her. See, he's all winning to win her over the board. He's trying to win her over, and that's exactly what he ends up doing. But uh, boy, it's a it's a struggle. I mean, it, you know, she didn't make it easy. Sure, what easy was it? So that. Mm. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. And see, she didn't deal with the other women because she was ashamed and. And probably, I mean, you know, the actually they could say all kinds of things. And probably a lot of the very women that she'd been going with, and she probably had some sort of an affair with some of their husbands or something there that they would accuse her of at the least, if not whether it was real or true. But uh, anyway, she avoided the other women of the city by going in the heat of the day. And Jesus, though, now think of battle again, the struggle. Uh, is it a struggle to see soul saved? Okay, uh, Jesus' day begins by going into the temple where he ends up confined with the Pharisees. 
He does that, no doubt, very deliberately. And verses before this will show you him pleading with them and brokenhearted and asking why they must perish because he was going to die for them. He was that sacrifice, whether they want to believe it or not. Yeah. And he says, why must you die? And, and so here he's come back in, and then again he clearly reveals that he and the Father are one. And that if you believe in the Father, if you really believe in God, you believe in him. And he brought master, masterful revelations in him. So you see him reaching and boy, bringing the cross. And see, there's another thing too that goes in that text. These people had the scripture that he's talking to. You know, and so, you know, they, you know, it's amazing, but they're without excuse at every turn. They really are. And and yet Jesus beckoning them, pleading with them, and then even weeping over them and walks away. And uh, and basically, that's, at that point, really come down hard on them. And that's where the disciples come outside and saying, oh, you've offended the Pharisees. Now, how would you like those that you've trained? You're, you're God's son. And you've trained them up to this point, called them, trained them, uh, showed them miracles after miracles, raised the dead in front of them by this time, uh, done all these things, and they're sitting there saying that you offended the religious folks, of, the good religious folks of Jerusalem or of Israel. How would you feel about that? Yeah, you know, and yeah, we notice, though, notice, and, and this is something, and I think it was Mark once said, said, I never had seen the focus of Jesus like she did that night. She said, He had his heart and mind. And see, he had said, coming out of the temple, I of necessity must get to Samaria. It's a necessity. I've got to get there. And it says, if he, Jesus, you know, God himself, the very giver of time, was on the clock. He had to be there. That's that time when he was going to be there. He had to get there. And the disciples went, oh, he was offended. And then they hear back home to Samaria, they didn't have to go. Oh, my God, here we go, preaching through the desert again. You know, and all, you know, you just imagine and, and then they're going down at this descent of these stair stairs. If you ever got a real good uh, outline or a drawing of the Jerusalem temple, you really understand how they come down ways, good ways, and then they let them off a little bit and they go down again. And Jesus is going down through there, and somewhere in there, there's the blind man, the lame man. I still never got back to look that up. But uh, anyway, Jesus was going down to down through there, and they look down and see the blind man somewhere down in front. I was going to say he's blind. And Jesus, uh, they turn to Jesus and says, what sin did he do? Right? So now let's stop and have a conversation with the one that's taking away our sins about one sin that he did. Who are we not thinking of? Huh? Okay, yeah, but you, yeah, boy, that's definitely not going to be done. But remember, he, coming out of the temple, he says, of need, of necessity, I must get to uh, Samaria. Okay, and so who's Jesus thinking of? God. Yeah, the woman that's going to be out there at the well. That's all that Jesus is thinking of. Right? And I notice how he keeps his mind so focused. And this was kind of Martha's point. She said, you know, until we really see someone that's really lost, and we become so focused on seeing them saved that we won't be distracted, that we'll keep on that mission, that one mission, and that nothing can throw us. And and then she really realized something that had been seen almost every class. This guy's notice it takes this prayer and desire. But if you're not desiring for someone to be saved, with a, and I mean someone, it's got to be a Carlos to you. It's got to be a real person. If you're not desiring to be saved, so much that you pray for them, for that person, that, you know, if they were the ones going to the well, that you would go out outside that temple, you would push past the unbelief of the religious, the ridicule of your own disciples, without engaging, dealing with all that, even during, oh, you guys are this or that. See, you never, never allowed to the, the loss of time or thought. He kept his whole intentions on winning that one woman. 
And then when they come on down and here they go blaspheming, honestly, you know, what sin did that person do? And Jesus says he didn't do any sin. And, and a lot of people get all in heat about that because everybody sins. That ain't what Jesus was talking about. If the man wasn't crippled because of his sin or blind because of the sin, he was, and he later says it. Then they come around and say, well, what sin did his parents do? Surely mom and dad did sin. There's got to be some kind of logical means that God sent this terrible condition on you because something you've done. Right? And that's that's their law. They're still not, they're not, he's the savior. The king of kings. He just healed all kinds of, all kinds of cripples and sick and blind and raised the dead. You know, some of there, they should have gone, duh, you know. But, you know, that's what happens to us. We're all kind of mental retarded when it comes in those areas. But Jesus just keeps like, and he says, oh, for the glory of God, this man was healed. And he speaks the words, and the man's healed. Yay! Right? And so God is glorified. Right? And so why did Jesus see? And he never allowed that to slow him one bit. He didn't engage the unbelief of the disciples. And all their incorrect theology, because all they're seeing is sin, when he's the one that's to take away the sins. And by the way, I believe it's right there, after this event, I mean, before this event, that Jesus says to some Pharisees in the temple, he, they said, are you saying that we're of sin? And Jesus said, if you see sin, your sins remain. Now look at his disciples. What sin did his mothers do? You know, what did sin did daddy do? What sin did he do? What you know, it's gotta be something that's something about a sin, right? And so notice, guys, how many times if you wanted to talk somebody about Jesus, but honestly in your mind and spirit, you was captivated by sin one way or the other. You understand what I mean? About your sins. You know, it may have been, you know, oh, gosh, you know, I talk to this person about it, I'm the worst, or I've done the worst, you do that, right? You know, see, you get, you know, see, you're captive, you're, you're, you fell in the same trick. And you see, you fell in the same, and guys, this is what we've got to dig out and discover every step of the way. Because we can't, I mean, you can't be thinking about your sins, but you can't be thinking about sin. You have to be thinking of the Savior from sin. See, that's what we can really get down. Because, boy, well, say, Clyde, you know, throw a sin and we'll remind you of something, you know, break your consciousness and your awareness, and you'll jump right on the sin issue. And then the woman's over there perishing. Who I am and what I've done is who he is and what he did. Absolutely, Rosemary, it's way, it always says, but how quickly and easily we sad we become. Because he's the Savior, guys, from sin. You were him, you got it made. Don't think about sin no more. Sin is a dead issue. Isn't it? It's separated. It's gone. So don't even think about a sin again. And you say, because that ain't for you. It's not for you. And you can look and you see the world and the ugliness and the hate and the hurt. And you may wish it wasn't that way. And I do. I do. And you should. Paul did. Jesus did. Wish it wasn't that way. But you know what? When all they're living and everything, it still ain't you. Does that make sense? Because you've been delivered from the end of their sins. Absolutely. And you're always thanking God for Jesus. So, you know, you think about that. How about this? Uh, so, you know, the decline out of the temple, the offense toward religion. How many of us would be a, slowed up if we thought we were thinking of religion? How many of you slowed up when somebody says, but you smell? Have you, have you had that one out? Yeah, some of your family and some of them, you know, yeah, Alex, I know, is really trying to reach for some of your family members. And and I imagine, I'm almost positive they've done this. I don't know how to do I can't remember what Ricardo did that night. <laughs> he was jumping on. Boy, she wrote why she done a great job, though, but she kept bringing Christ to every turn. And, and he had to walk away from Christ. He, his little, all his stuff was stuff and when it was left his stuff, whether well, it was still Jesus right there, he'd come and say like that. It had just turned the cause. Right 
so anyway, Jesus is now against think of the trip across the hot desert. How many of us have been be sad of um, just over the effort it's gonna take, what's demanded of us? Going across the hot desert, you're gonna sweat. You're probably gonna be called in there. <laughs> <laughs> Rudy's hurt is gonna hurt. Maybe the back's going out. Yeah, yeah. Cram, cram, yeah. <laughs> Vince is going to find the can't hold the work on or something. Isn't that right? Gabby yeah, will stop and teach Google. <laughs> it's kind of neat, isn't it? You know, to, to think of how easily we can get snared, but then you see Jesus and boy, just pushing past everything. Uh, yeah, another part is you hear you got. These guys are supposed to be your support. Wouldn't that hurt your feelings and drag you down? You know, and I mean, just to get out of the temple, hear them say those things about you, that, you know, you're an offense to somebody else when you're the king of kings and the Lord of Lord. Then to drag it out about sins and the sins of the mom and dad and on and on. And then finally, you're finally on the road and Jesus is leading the way right across there. You remember, Jesus is little, real little. And his legs don't cover about that much, so he's on the to get across there. I think Peter was pretty tall, and so he probably didn't have to stretch a lot of you know, to get on across the there. But the next thing you hear from them is a murmuring and complaining about their hunger. How many of us have done that? We get hungry, so we got to go to Burger King instead of seeing who we're supposed to go see. Right? Or whatever, you know. Yeah, so they, they go to murmuring about their hunger, and yet Jesus pushes on. He never lets it slow him. And then all, and somewhere in there, he evidently said, go on. Go on to McDonald's or whatever. But he said, go on, buy your pill or whatever it is. Uh, you know, and so he sets thus on the well, and they've gone into town. The woman appeared. The events takes place, and when the disciples come back offering him, he says, I have food that you know not of. So, you know, and then, the, of course, the glorious part of it all is boy, his masterful soul winning techniques with the woman. And I really want us to dissect those. I want us to be able to walk through this class and really look. Look at what she brings up. I mean, and hers is so real and natural. You'd think it was just, uh, you know, and, and you're sure, uh, you know, you ought to almost be sure. That she would have had. And then Jesus keeps walking and he keeps walking. And when she makes it evident, she would tell this to him, which was a, a part of custom and tradition again. Then he says, Call your husband. And she says, I have no husband. And then again, the wisdom of Christ of truth, of truth, of truth. You know, uh, you would have no husband. Billy Bob that you're living with. Robert, <laughs> he ain't your husband at all. Excuse me for a week or two. Next day, it's laundry money or your camel bag or something. Okay. Uh, but either way, you know. It's just amazing to me how they never, how Jesus is never distracted from any of this, and he just keeps that thing going up and down. And then he has to, you know, she fails to see. What's really amazing too is that he's given her the solution, and he doesn't try to make an issue of her problem. And he does that until she will refuse to see him as anything special. Because he's already told her, I mean, if you ask, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me, and I'd give you water that you'd never heard. And I uh, thought that was just uh, sweet music, wasn't it? And uh, but she goes, I don't know what is it, you know, and then she blows that off, and she just keeps. And usually, if we get kind of turned down, or somebody acts like they don't want to hear one part, I'd be pretty well done. Yeah, but we know oh, so easy. We just heard. but see, Jesus never gives up. You know, and that's another real big point. Uh, is that he he's all he's gonna keep pressing. You you throw something out there, he's gonna use that somehow 
And see, so she threw out every one of those you know, Everything that he used is things that she threw out at. Uh, she wouldn't would acknowledge her sin. He made it very evident. And, uh, and he heard him tell her that he could solve every thirst. And the one thirst everybody has is to be right. Everybody really wants to be right with God. And, uh, and if there was that out there, you know. Anyway, he just keeps pounding down through there. And finally, when he says uh, about her husbands and all that, then she says, all oh, I have heard, which tells us what. What should that tell us? Yeah, if somebody had preached the gospel, that's the honest truth, preached, taught, uh, maybe it's mom, maybe it's a song, maybe it's, I don't know, but somewhere she said, but, and it's probably pretty evident, she said, we have heard, and then the bad way she's saying it is like this has been taught and taught and taught, that there's one that's coming to take away our sin, they can tell us all, and first know our sin, and then take it away. Can you see that? And, and so she said, there's one coming, and the one was the Messiah, the Messiah, which is always a general term of one that would take away our sins, is what that word means. And, uh, and boy, she goes down through there and says, wow, you know, when I was told this and told this and told this, was, that's what she said. I was told and told and told. Then all of a sudden, out of the mouth of Jesus, I am he. See, and, and I really, in my own opinion, I don't think she's seen Jesus as a savior until he said that. I think she's still scrambling around the back of her mind, you know, where did this Jew come from? Why is he asking a woman? Yeah, all those same questions. But all of a sudden, when she's going through, man, I heard of Messiah. I heard of one that would come. I heard of one that would tell me all things. And then when Jesus said, I am he, she knew one thing. She knows, substitute, this is not some off brand. This is him. He's right here. This is, this is my Savior. And then with great joy, she leaps up. What do you suppose happened to them? He said, I am he. What happened? It's a conversion. I want to talk, show you winning or converting. What happened when Jesus says, I am he? Look at the woman. Tell me what happened. I am he. Okay, reality. Yeah. What did you just say, Robert? Reality who he was. Yeah, I know the words you said. What did you just say? That I heard. <laughs> yeah, no, but faith. That's what you see. Faith. You know, you're saved by grace through faith. And faith only comes from hearing words of God. I am He. Bam. Boom. Desire, mind, mind, that's him. Desire, wow, he's taking that's him that's taking away my sins. My sins are, he's here, he's God. He's taking away, he's right here. Can you see, you know, what's happening? Go on with it, he's, she's got reality. Now what? Go on, walk it out. Quick, 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 I'm gonna go home. <laughs> but, 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 what to say it, Carlos? She, Carlos is saying, believe it, believe it. She be lived. She be lived him as the Savior, didn't she? I mean, that's, there ain't no question. There's nothing to talk about. She has her sins has been taken away. He's standing right there. He's it. You see, he's it. Now, how do we know that she's so converted? Show us more. Remember, faith is not without evidence. Man, there's all kinds of evidence here. Okay, first, take take one thing and uh, spit it. But if you how Okay, yeah, remember it? She, she really was moved by the Spirit. And the Spirit that's in those words that Jesus spoke exploded in her heart and her mind. Man, that's him. And, you know, in that, there's another key witness. See, Jesus is a witness. The Holy Spirit in them words is a witness. And I mean, where two or more, she becomes convinced that there's the one that took away her sins. But show me more. Show me the evidence that her sin is taken away. I mean, to her, they are gone. Show me the evidence that to her, they are gone. Okay, yeah. Uh, but no, no evidence. 
Okay, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, back up. Oh, yeah, she did, man. And it's, oh, it's so descriptive. It gives you everything of evidence. Let, let me show you some evidence. That's the thing. Huh? Well, wait, wait. No. I got another story for me. Okay. Uh, guys, don't show me evidence. Remember, how was she? What would have been her posture? What would have been his pride of Pogachon? Okay, what did she have? What she know? What she came after? With? Oh, a big old water pot that she put up on the top of her head, usually, and carried. So that's a shoulder bit from the small type, and shoulder, shoulder two of them. But the bigger one, they put up on their head, and they even have a little rack that they set it up on. And here they go, uh, you know, what with this here. All of a sudden, where's the water pot? Okay, she didn't need it no more. That's an evidence, isn't it? She don't need it no more. No, and you know, she ain't scared of women either. You know, I mean, as you start going through this, you ought to send the evidence right out. What all is the evidence of her conversion? Because one is that she was filled with joy. She leaps upward. So evidently, she must have been in a kneeling setting, something, or maybe bent over with the pots. I don't, I'm not sure. But anyway, she is now leaping with joy. You better rejoice. And she leaves what? The ark. And guys, you don't leave your water pot. You're dead if you go off and leave your water pot. Somebody will steal it that 99% of the time because a water pot is about the most valuable in the desert country. Something that could hold water is the most valuable that you could ever have. And then all of a sudden, she didn't need that as value. She was going to go tell people what she did, that the Messiah was here. That the one thing you're away ever seeing. Then, tell me more evidence. How about this? She runs to the city. What does that show you? Tell me, tell me the human emotion. Tell, tell me one thing. She was excited. Okay, excited. Confess. Okay. Tell me one. Joyful. Rejoicing. Rejoicing. Tell me one. She wanted to go to. Wanted. That's almost too weak, Rosemary. I mean, look at it. Needed. Needed to. Yes, I mean, I mean, look at it. She had no choice but to go. Yeah, no, now think of it. We're grasping evidence of her crossed over. She moved out of, across the border. She moved out of south into Jesus. Yes, yeah, she's renewed more energy, you'd have to say, man. And it's a spiritual energy, isn't it, Rob? Okay. Okay, she wanted to go tell. Why did she want to go tell? Okay, Christine, you know, uh, Christine's right kind of really at the heart's door, but uh, she's all of a sudden getting the same urgency Jesus had for her. And, and I really believe that's very, very true. But I didn't say what you said there, too, because well, there's truth in that one, too. Why did you go Wanted, yeah, wanted to go tell. Why does she want to go tell? And remember, this is the woman scorned by the other women. This is the woman that has multiple affairs, and if you probably knew the truth, it was probably far greater and a lot more and deeply intense than what was spoken of there with Jesus. <coughs> you, you, know, you know, why didn't Jesus want to dig out every one of the little nooks and crannies of the that woman singing. Huh? Do what? All those things that she had. Yeah, he already knew it. Yeah, he already knew that. But why doesn't he make her face up to him or all that stuff? What, what, I mean, he did it enough to where she knew she was a sinner. There's no doubt. And, and, and knew that he knew she. He made it so clear that he knew her sin. But why didn't he dig it through all of her life of sin? Because he is the savior from sin. He was the one who made your sins away. But you know, she didn't need to have to be read through the life of my life. Isn't that amazing? <clears throat> That's amazing. And boy, it's just God kind of loving us, guys. It is. Okay, guys, and when she gets there, she says, Come and see him who told me all things. 
And then again, half believed her, or I say half, there was a great multitude that believed her. There was another that said they didn't believe her, but they'd go see her. Now, wouldn't her testimony be awful powerful? Because you really already rejected someone telling your messenger that you're rejecting them. Yeah, and then, yeah, you want to go see if there's anybody too busy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it could have been the same thing, right? <laughs> Maybe I better go check this guy out. He might be right on, you know. Yeah. So, anyway, we see uh, her just tearing out there, and the guy's wonderful fun, too. Uh, and and then the next is the multitudes coming, and that's what Jesus tells the disciples. Well, the harvest is just plenty, but the laborers are few. And think about this just a little bit. What did Jesus mean by the laborers are few? And he says, "Pray therefore that God would add laborers to the harvest." What? Mm -hmm. But the laborers, are, the harvest is truly plenteous. But the laborers, are, as he was seen and, and had them to see, and said, Look, the harvest is truly plenteous. Multitudes of people, a countless number of Jesus. You know, he was saying, What's that? Was he saying he needed others to spread the word? Uh, I don't you know. I guess I'd say spread the word. No, I think he needed, you know, disciple. Is one like yourself. Uh, I think he needs somebody who can push past the religion. I think he's needing somebody that can push past, past someone's sins or the thought that the sin is the cause of every illness. You know, I think he needs somebody that can be for you getting across the hard desert to preach the gospel to someone else. And you see, I think somebody, he needs somebody for, uh, you know, really bringing some words of God, the bread of life, to somebody before we fill our own belly full of McDonald's. Yes, absolutely. Right. Yeah, well, that's so true. Absolutely, that's so true. Everybody good tonight? Well, I'd love you. We end up having a full class. Uh, I love you and love you. It's good, isn't it? And a good thinking and a challenging kind of in our hearts and spirits. Uh, you know, guys, do you realize what, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Tell me what's going to happen with us. Now, it's good. That's all right. Just tell me what's going to happen. Be a prophet. Prophesying. Yes, for us. What's, what's going to happen? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. Think about what are we doing to Monday night? Is there an objective? Are we really something that we're working at to accomplish? Is there a certain amount of training that's going on? Okay. Then what are, what are we? Yeah, the right saying we're building faith. Well, I do. You know, I think we are, but. Again, kind of the faith without the expenditure of energy. Yeah, it doesn't go nowhere. But what's going to happen? What are you supposed to happen? How many of you could walk past a religious person then? I'm talking about a person sitting there and he's giving the God from how you read the law and you're how good and that. Okay, right. See? Okay, so, you know, that's a step. That's a big step. How many of us could get past somebody talking about somebody's sins? Or wanting to know about their sins? Or how about this talking about, can we get past them? Yeah. We really, and what I mean by getting past is that we'd stay on purpose of bringing Jesus and, you know, the Savior of, from our sins to somebody someplace else. Right. Amen, mean, which right there, you know, being in that position because, you know, like the people that I've got are doing my job, you know, and showing them the compassion of, you know, the, you know, not seeing and seeing and knowing what the, 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 the sin is already paid for. And just being able to share that with them, that they have to live in the guilt of the And then being able to see, see past their seeing 
seeing their soul and what God has done for me and knowing what He can do for you, that truly you don't have to live with that guilt or that burden. Mm -hmm. You know, guys, one of the things that really trips us up, and let me use the the, the illustration of state lines or uh, country lines, but like I said, you know, that you draw on the sand or whatever. You know, uh, something that's really big is that we're asking people to really to be transformed. You know that that they're actually stepping out, leaving something totally behind. Now, what do we actually naturally want to think that we're leaving behind? Robert's so right and honest. But is, do we really believe our sins? No. You really don't now when you do. Uh, no. No. Try not to remember them. Try not to remember <laughs> Have you ever tried not to remember them? Guys, what are you doing if you're trying not to remember Remember <laughs> Jesus takes them away. Jesus takes them away. That's what we moved into. It is Jesus that blots out our sins. It's Jesus that has washed us. Why do you suppose he turns to disciples now for several years, at least two and a half, three years, of, of his own disciples, and he's heading down to his last days on earth, and he turns around and he goes through that spill about, I have washed you, I have, uh, I have loved you. You know, why is it all of a sudden that, you know, and he does it and find it behind how it works. You know, tell me, Jason. See, yeah, they're still not living free of their sin. You know, because they actually know that in the flesh, they're still dragging their own sins around. Man. But guys, aren't they living somewhere else? At the same time, guys, we're all living somewhere else. We're not living in our sin no more. And do we sin? Absolutely. But we don't live in. We're living in a plan that our Savior takes care of our sins. Does that make sense? And, and the reason that's big is because Puritanism, I try to throw it back on them. And honestly, a lot of those guys, honestly, the reason they ended up down roads was because so many of the Catholic Church criticized them, not just Catholics and others, but criticized the real Puritan or Protestant people, saying, well, you're just saying it's all right to sin. Haven't you heard that? Yeah. And don't they say that to you? Haven't yeah. people said that to you? Yeah. Well, you're just saying it's all right. So you say, well, no, I'm not. And then you've got to go defend something. No, it's not saying it's all right. Jesus just took care of our sins, and that's the end of the sin. There's nothing to talk about sin to me because I'm in Christ. Now, if you're going to talk sin, then you're outside of him, and you're over there living someplace else. If you're in Jesus, you can't talk about your sins no more. Now, I don't know, trail, that was a big point there that we've got to define in soul link. But make sure when you're telling people, hey, listen, you can tell them that you, you don't have to live guilty in your sins if you cross over in Jesus Christ. Now, man, if they ain't going to cross in Jesus, they're still in their sins. And they're going to talk their sins. They're going to live without sin one way or the other. They're going to be doing them all the time. No matter what side of the border, you're going to have sin. You, can you see? But there's one group that's going to live guilty, condemned over them, and separated from God. Does that make sense? The other group's going to live in Jesus, and what they have eternal life. They've been washed. Yeah, they are, but they're, they're demonstrators. Yeah, they're demonstrating God's great love the way that He loves us. Guys, I love you. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for this evening. I thank you for every precious soul, Lord, that made it out tonight. Lord, I pray for all of our church. And Lord, may this little time that we've had together really just uh, benefit uh, not only us, Lord, but be able to equip us that we can benefit all the others. Lord, we just pray, use us this week. Help us to see others say, Lord, help us in all of our endeavors, the mission fields that you've called us to, as well as, Lord, the school and just all the other things. Father, we ask it all in Jesus' name. I pray it. Amen. Amen. Uh, guys, I have to say this. I am so thankful to our missions in, in Mexico in particular. Uh, boy, there's some wonderful, wonderful little white lights going off left and right. Our school.